Boyce Watkins, and I have a really fascinating story to tell you about a company that you may have heard of called Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is now worth, according to a stock market analysis and uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, this company is worth about $226 billion. But I'm about to tell you a story about Coca-Cola and how this company, this powerful, uh, massive corporation, was started for just $2,300, actually purchased for $2,300, started for even less by a drug addict a little more than 100 years ago. So we're going to get started on the Black Financial Channel right now. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, Financial Juneteenth TV uh, and Dr. Boyce TV. I'm simulcasting. And uh, one thing I want you to know about this platform is that we're black first. Uh, we talk about the black community first. We talk about ways to empower ourselves, make ourselves better people help us to build things for our future and for our children's future so that our community will rise once again. If you agree with this philosophy that black people come first, put hashtag B1 in the chat. Put your hashtag B1 in the chat uh, when you're chatting about anything that's empowering and black, anything regarding reparations, anything involving wealth building, anything involving poweronomics, write hashtag B1 in the chat. And also feel free to shout out your city. I'd love to hear what city you're from. And I see you, Bridget Edmonds and Terry Cobb and El Hodge and McCann Cornell. How you doing? Good to see you. All right. So what I wanted to talk about today was actually a story that I just uh, read about a company that you may have heard of called Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola, uh, I, the other day I heard Jeezy, Young Jeezy, in his versus battle with Gucci Mane. Uh, Gucci Mane was talking about, I guess, his uh, his clothes and his ice and stuff like that. And and Jeezy came back and said, I don't have a $10,000 outfit, but I own half of Atlanta. And uh, I thought I think that's great. I love that that promotion of real estate. I love that promotion of black wealth. Uh, but uh, one thing I will tell you is, um, is that mindset is very powerful. But I'll tell you who really might own half of Atlanta. It's the Coca-Cola Corporation. Uh, Coca-Cola employs thousands and thousands and thousands of people in Atlanta. It's a massive, massive company. It's one of the biggest economic players in the city. They even have a museum. They even have a museum in in Atlanta. Has anybody ever seen the Coca-Cola Museum? It's kind of fascinating. So let me let me go ahead and, and break this down for you. I, I want to tell you guys the story of how Coca-Cola came to be, and I I shared this story because. I want you to realize that a lot of these companies that you see, these big, massive, multi-billion dollar companies, a lot of them were started with almost nothing. A lot of them, a lot of these companies were started with less money than you have right now. A lot of these companies were started with less money than a lot of you have right now. A lot of their founders had no idea how great and how extraordinary these companies were going to be. Most of their founders had no idea what God had in store for them. And and that and I bring this up because some of y'all got some more raggedy, tiny little businesses where you think it ain't going to amount to nothing. You're, maybe you're even embarrassed. Give me a yes or no in the chat if you've ever felt this way. If you've ever sort of looked at what you got going on and said, man, this ain't nothing. Why, why would I even put my time into this stupid thing? This ain't nothing. Has anybody ever felt that way? Come on, let's do a quick confession. You guys know we have Black Wealth Confessions. So I want you to come to the altar and confess to me that there have been times where you doubted yourself, where you kind of felt like whatever you had going on wasn't, wasn't, wasn't amounting to nothing, and that you, you might as well just go on and go back and work for the white man because at least at least you can get a decent paycheck out of it. Has anybody ever felt that way? Give me a yes or no. I'm going to say yes three times over because uh, that would actually and that, that would actually be an understatement because it's probably happened a thousand times. It's been a thousand times where I looked at what I had going on and said, man, this is raggedy. This ain't nothing. Like, how am I going to compete? I, I, what what's the point, right? And and here's the thing: so Coca Cola was actually bought for twenty three hundred dollars. Now Van Hurst says twenty three hundred dollars was, was a lot of money back then. That's a great point. You know what twenty three hundred dollars was back in, when when Coca Cola was purchased for twenty three hundred? Uh, it was about sixty thousand dollars, about sixty grand, about sixty grand. Now now I want you to now now sixty grand. That is a lot more than twenty three hundred dollars. But I want you to compare sixty thousand dollars to two two hundred twenty six billion dollars. I want you to compare sixty thousand dollars to two hundred twenty six billion dollars. How many of you have ever? How many of you? If I were to add up all the money that you spent on clothes and shoes and fast food and getting your hair done, if I was to add all that up just over the last decade alone, do you, give me a yes or no. Would, would would that number add up to more than sixty sixty thousand dollars? Give me a yes or no. 
give me a yes or no. If I was to add up all the Popeye's chicken and, and cheeseburgers and Air Jordans uh, that a lot of folks buy, would that add up to more than $60,000? Seriously, I, I want to lay that out there because I, I know Van Hur, I know you meant well, and I'm not at all uh, making fun of your statement at all because that's a good point. I knew, I, I knew someone was going to bring that point up, so I came ready to talk about that. Sixty thousand dollars. Mike Jones says, "Yeah, they we got we got people out here, ain't got no wealth, ain't got no assets, but got a car worth more than that. Got a car worth sixty grand. So, so when you talk about twenty three hundred dollars, yes, it was a lot of money back then. No, you no, you didn't go flipping around twenty three hundred dollars like it ain't nothing. But if you compare twenty three hundred dollars or AKA sixty thousand dollars." to a company that is now worth $226 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars. That is a hell of a flip. You know, Gucci Mane used to rap about uh, flipping birds. Ain't no bird. You flip a bird like that, you flipping big bird. You flipping a a, a pterodactyl. Like, that's a, that's a big bird you flipping right there. If you flip 60 grand into a quarter of a trillion dollars. So, so let me go into this. I, I want you guys to hear this story because I know some of y'all, we, the problem is we sometimes have white supremacists in the building. We get a lot of white supremacists in the building. And here's the thing. Most of the white supremacists that come into my building are not white people. White people don't pay no attention to me hardly. They only time they pay attention to me is when I, I make them mad. Like I say something and then suddenly I'm in the mainstream media and they talk crazy about me because they don't like black liberation. They don't they, they think any black person who thinks black people can do something positive or build something on their own is out of his freaking mind. He must be insane. That's the only time they pay attention to me. But then I, I do attract white supremacists who happen to have black skin. And what they'll do is they'll look at something like this where some white guy, this this drug addict, this drug addict, this morphium. Mor- morphium, morphium, morph- morph- morphine, morphine. I said morphine. My thing about the Matrix. This morphine addict named John Pemberton was able to flip twenty three hundred dollars into two hundred twenty six billion, and they'll say, "Yeah, but that's not possible for me. We can't do that. We're, we're not smart enough, right?" And 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 I I beg to differ. I I, I personally don't just think you're not. I, I don't not only think that you're smart enough. I think you're actually smarter than other people. So anyway, let me keep it going. Here you go. That URL on the screen, that's blackwealthcalendar.com. We actually put out a Black Wealth Calendar for 2021. If you want to get one and put wealth principles on your refrigerator for your children and your family to see every day or to remind yourself of who you are, feel free to go to blackwealthcalendar.com. Uh, they're on they're on sale. You can buy one right now. And text the word BOYCE to 31996 if you want to get text alerts periodically when we go live. Text BOYCE to 31996. It's right there on the ticker on the screen. And uh, please hit the thumbs up button, share, and subscribe button, and hit that notification bell also. So here, I'm going to read some of this to you. This this will blow your mind. This, this will get you going. This will make you want to go in and work on that little raggedy business. Give me a yes or no if you can hear me okay. I'm switching my screen so I can read this to you. Uh, this is this is uh, like a bedtime story, except you may be listening to this in the morning. So, uh, so I'm gonna read you a little story. So check this out. This is this is all this is just straight off Wikipedia, but the, the information's uh, accurate. Confederate Colonel John Pemberton. So he was with the Confederacy now, and but now but remember, Coca Cola owns half Adla- half of Atlanta. Jeezy said he owned half Atlanta, but I think Coca Cola might really own half of Atlanta, or they they probably own a little bit more than Jeezy does. But that doesn't mean Jeezy ain't doing nothing special. That just means Coca Cola is a big company. So Confederate Colonel John Pemberton, wounded in the American Civil War and addicted to morphine, he also had a medical degree, and began a quest to find a substitute for the problematic drug morphine. In 1885, at Pemberton's Eagle Drug and Chemical House, his drugstore in Columbus, Georgia, he registered Pemberton's French wine coca nerve tonic. Pemberton's tonic may have been inspired by the formidable success of Vin Mariana, a French Corsican coca wine, but his recipe additionally included African cola nut, the beverage's source of caffeine. So uh, he, he basically... Uh, took some ideas that were already out there. He took some stuff that uh, the other people were doing, and he just kind of flipped the birds into something that was uh, more appropriate for what he wanted to create. Uh, the the, the uh, French coca wine was already out there. Um, I I don't know if coca wine means it had cocaine in it or not, but I know at that time, cocaine wasn't seen the way it's seen right now. 
And and it's ironic. I mean, just just yesterday I was talking about Jeezy and Gucci, and we were talking about the drug culture and cocaine. So apparently this cocaine thing's been around for a minute, right? And also he used something from Africa, just like the rest of the world, just like the rest of the world. He he, he went and got African cola nuts, uh, which which is yet another example of how African resources have contributed to the wealth of white people all around the world. That there are people, there are major multi-trillion dollar, multi-billion dollar corporations that built their wealth off of African resources. This goes back to poweronomics. Dr. Claude Anderson talks about the doctrine of unequal exchange, where, where your resources have been used, your resources, your, your oil and, and your diamonds and silver out of Africa, your labor has been used to build multi-billion dollar empires all over the world. So he used African cola nuts in the very first uh, Coca-Cola. It is also worth noting that a Spanish drink called Cola Coca was presented at a contest in Philadelphia in 1885, a year before the official birth of Coca-Cola. The rights for the Spanish drink were bought by Coca-Cola in 1953. So let me ask you this question. Give me a yes or no. So the guy who founded Coca-Cola, the drug addict, the morphine addict, who, who fought for the Confederacy, that, that's the side that wanted to keep you in slavery, he goes to Atlanta and he forms this company and, 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 he, and he copies off the French wine, uh, the cocoa wine. He uses African cola nuts. So he gets that other thing from Africa. And he names his company Coca-Cola. And there happened to be a Spanish company called Cola Coca. Do you think that there's any connection? Do you think that he might have stole that name? Do you think he might have stole somebody's intellectual property? His company is called Coca-Cola. And there was another company called Cola Coca. You think you think that was original? You think he just came up with that on his own? Or you think he might have... He might have jacked somebody to get that name. What what, what do y'all think? Give me a yes or no in the chat if you think he stole the name. What do you think? So so all this, th this is what's interesting, right? This is kind of this kind of shows that a lot of people built a lot of really large legitimate empires off of theft, off of illegal behavior. You know, I, 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 you know, maybe maybe they started in the trap, maybe they started hustling and doing stuff that was against the law, but they flipped that into something legitimate within a generation or two. I, I find that really fascinating. So let's keep going. Let's keep talking about how this uh, drug addict, John Pemberton, founded Coca-Cola and the co how Coca-Cola was eventually purchased for $2,300. I'll read more. In 1886, when Atlanta and Fulton County passed prohibition leg legislation, so this this is all going down right in Atlanta, right where, Gu where Gucci and Jeezy and Stacey Abrams are holding uh, their versus battles. In Atlanta, uh, they passed prohibition legislation. Pemberton responded by developing Coca-Cola, a non-alcoholic version of Pemberton's French wine coca. It was marketed as, quote, Coca-Cola, the temperance drink. That means something you drink if you don't want to drink alcohol. But y'all know Coca-Cola started off with some, uh, if you want to get high, Coca-Cola could still help you get high back then. Which appealed, it appealed to many people as the temperance movement enjoyed wide support during this time. The first sales were at Jacob's Pharmacy in Atlanta. So they're selling dope out of the dope house, except it was a, a pharmacy. Uh, it, was, it was considered a cure for many diseases, including morphine addiction, indigestion, nerve disorders, headaches, and impotence. So if your stuff wasn't working, you can't make your wife happy, drink some Coca-Cola. If you got headaches, well, here, drink some Coca-Cola. If your nerves are bad, then, then go come and come and hit this Coca-Cola. Indigestion, no problem. We got some Coca-Cola for you. Are you addicted to mor morphine? You, you on that dope? Well, well, drink some of this. It'll make you feel better because this is just a different kind of dope. So Pemberton ran the first advertisement for the beverage in May 29th of the same year. This is 1889. Um, or sorry, 1886. In the Atlanta Journal. So the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, the newspaper that's still there today, that's where he ran the first advertisement for Coca-Cola. Now, th this is this is really fascinating. I, I, I personally found it interesting that this Confederate soldier who was a drug addict found a Coca-Cola. Uh, he stole the name from a company called Cola Coca. Uh, he was putting all kinds of dope in there. He pretty much did, did a lot of the marketing that we talked to you guys about in the Black Business School, where he linked his uh, his his drink to the temperance movement as a solution for temperance. Like if you if you can't drink alcohol, then drink this instead. He talked about how this thing, this Coca-Cola could cure a lot of things. And we know Coca-Cola don't cure nothing. 
all it does is make you fat and give you diabetes, right? But but he was but he was working it, right? He was working it. You can't hate on that, but that's just what it was. Um, so 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 this this reminds me the, the fact that he started Coca Cola and he actually used African cola nuts uh, and, and used resources from Africa to get this uh, brand off the ground. Uh, it reminds me of how so much of what we do economically, so much of what we do politically, mathematically, et cetera, was started in Africa. Africa is kind of the home of everything. It's the root and the origin of everything. So when you go out and you build your multi-million, multi-billion dollar empires for your family, just know you're only doing what you were supposed to do. And if you want inspiration, actually, tonight we're showing our new film. Our new film is called Happy. Happy, H-A-P-I. Happy goes back to ancient Africa and shows you how modern economic systems used throughout the world were, were started and developed in Egypt, in Kemet, in Kush, in ancient Africa. This film was shot all throughout the globe. It's, it took five years to get this done. Taki Grant's the director, and you're going to love it. So if you want to join us tonight, go to blackmovienight.net. Uh, bring your whole family. It's a great history lesson. Uh, hit the thumbs up button. Please, <clears throat> please hit the thumbs up button, share, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell if you're watching on YouTube. Make sure you do that. Or if you're on Facebook, hit the follow button so you can follow. Because you, you guys know you don't get content like this anywhere else on the internet. Uh, we break things down for you. But I can do that. I have a PhD, so I'm good at these things. So let, let me keep reading to you. This is about how Coca-Cola was started by a drug addict in the, in the 19th century. By 1888, three versions of Coca-Cola sold by three different businesses were on the market. A, co a co-partnership had been formed on January 14th, 1888 between Pemberton and four Atlanta businessmen. So this was all going on in Atlanta, 120 years before Jeezy, 140 years before Jeezy and Gucci and Stacey Abrams and, and the Trap and the Coca-Cola Museum. This is how it all, all got started. So Pemberton had a partnership with four Atlanta businessmen, J.C. Mayfield, A.O. Murphy, C.O. Malahi, E.H. Bloodworth not codified by any signed documents. So they had no documents. They had no idea that what they were working on, this little raggedy ass business they had, was going to be worth a quarter of a trillion dollars a uh, hundred years later. They had no idea, right? So they, they, they signed no documents to secure their ownership. They just sort of did business the way a lot of us do business. Just like, okay, sure. Yeah, whatever, man. All right. Okay. All right, Brett, bet. Okay. This ain't going to be much, but this will help me pay the rent this month. Right. Uh, not codified by any signed document, a verbal statement given by Asa Candler years later asserted under testimony that he had acquired a stake in Pemberton's company as early as 1887. Remember that name, Asa Candler. That's an important name. John Pemberton declared that <clears throat> the name Coca-Cola belonged to his son, Charlie. So John Pemberton, the drug addict Confederate soldier, who started Coca-Cola, declared that the name Coca-Cola belonged to his son, Charlie. But the other two manufacturers could continue to use the formula. So what he said, what Pimper did, the, the drug addict Confederate soldier who started Coca-Cola, said is, we own the name Coca-Cola. Names matter. He said, we own the name, and my son, I'm giving it to my son. <clears throat> but the other two manufacturers can use the formula. So you can keep making your Coca-Cola, you can sling your dope on your corner, but we own the name Coca-Cola. Why is that important? I'm gonna tell you why. Charlie Pemberton, the son of, uh, of John Pemberton, the drug addict who started Coca-Cola, Charlie Pemberton's record of control over the Coca-Cola name was the underlying factor that allowed him to participate as a major shareholder in the March 1988 Coca-Cola Company Incorporation filing made in his father's place. So in 1888, that is when Coca-Cola became incorporated. 1888, Coca-Cola, the massive quarter of a trillion dollar company that runs half, that owns half of Atlanta, became incorporated in 1888. <clears throat> Charlie Pemberton, the son of John Pemberton, the drug addict who started the company, was able to get his foot in, in, the, in the transaction by saying that I own the name Coca-Cola. My father, or sorry, uh, so, yeah, my father uh, started all of this, so uh, I'm, I'm in this game too. So let me keep going. In March 88, Coca-Cola Company Incorporation filed, filing uh, was made in his father's place. Charlie's exclusive control over the Coca-Cola name became a continual thorn in Asa Chandler's side. So, can, uh, sorry, Candler, sorry. Asa Candler was, was a guy who basically said that he had acquired a stake in the company in 1887. So Asa Candler was not in the family. John Pemberton, the drug addict who started the company, and his son Charlie, they owned the name, so they were part of the deal. Asa Candler also said, I bought a small stake in Coca-Cola. 
And I'm gonna tell you how much he bought his steak for it. And it's gonna it's gonna really make you mad when I tell you how, how much he paid for it. The deal was actually between Pemberton Son Charlie and Walker, Candler and Company, with John Pemberton acting as a co-signer for his son. For $50 down and $500 in 30 days, Walker, Candler, and company obtained a one-third interest in the Coca-Cola company that Charlie held. Charlie is the son of John. I want to make sure you get this right. Charlie is the son of the drug addict who started Coca-Cola. So Walker, Candler, and company got a one-third interest in Coca-Cola for $500. So I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. He was able to buy a third of Coca-Cola for $500 hundred dollars after the april 14th deal on april 17 1888 one half of the walker dozier interest shares were acquired by candler for an extra 750 dollars so another 750 dollars was put down they said hey this little raggedy company you have it's not worth much but i'll give you a few hundred bucks for it uh if you give me half of the company do you follow what i'm saying give me a yes or no if you're following this story okay so, so here, here's more to it. Let me keep reading this to you. So we're talking about Coca-Cola, how it was founded by a drug addict uh, who was a Confederate soldier. His son, Charlie, owned the name. But but Asa Candler, who was a visionary, he was a visionary like a lot of you in here. He saw, he said, you know what? This, this little raggedy ass drink, people might actually like this. People seem to be excited about this product. I'm going to go ahead and get my foot in the door and I'm going to put down some money so I can be an owner in this company. So check this out. In 1892, now this is just about six years after Coca-Cola was actually created, Candler set out to incorporate a second company, the Coca-Cola Company. When Candler had the earliest records of the Coca-Cola Company destroyed in 1910, the action was claimed to have been made during a move to new corporation offices around this time. After Candler had gained a better foothold on Coca-Cola in eight, April 1888, so Candler, Asa Candler, he wasn't the originator of Coca-Cola. He wasn't in the Pemberton family. Charlie and his dad, John, were, were actually the original founders. But Asa, Asa is kind of wiggling his way into the process because he's the visionary of this. So Asa Candler had gained a better foothold on Coca-Cola in April 1888. He nevertheless was forced to sell the beverage he produced with the recipe he had under the name Yum Yum and Coke. So he did not own the name Coca-Cola. So he tried, he had, but he did have the formula. So he was selling it under the name Yum Yum and Coke, K-O-K-E. This was while Charlie Pemberton was selling the elixir, although a cruder mixture under the name Coca-Cola, all with his father's blessing. So you have two players right now. You got Asa Candler, who's, who's a squirrel trying to get a nut. He's trying to break in the game. He's trying to get a piece of this, but he can't sell under the name Coca-Cola. He's selling a better drink but a worse name, Yum Yum and Coke, K-O-K-E. Charlie Pemberton, whose recipe is not as good, was selling under the name Coca-Cola because his father said, my son owns the name of this company. After both names failed to catch on for Candler by the middle of 1888, the Atlanta pharmacist was quite anxious. Uh, he was quite anxious uh, to, to basically adjust his position. That's what it says here. He, he actually wanted to make some changes. So check this out. Here's his opportunity. Here's his big opportunity. John Pemberton, the drug addict Confederate soldier who actually founded Coca-Cola, he died suddenly on, April, on August 16th, 1888. Asa Candler then quickly moved to swiftly, uh, swiftly attain control, full control, of the Coca-Cola Corporation. So he was making moves. So in the middle of crisis, when everybody's sad because he's dead, he said, okay, this is my chance. You see, I told you guys a thousand times, I've been breaking this down for y'all for a million years, that the word poor, what does the word poor stand for? P-O-O-R, that's an acronym. What does poor stand for? Somebody tell me what poor stands for in, 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 the, in, the, in the boys walking uh, space. Tell me what poor stands for. Yes, passing over opportunities repeatedly. Passing over opportunities repeatedly. So there was an opportunity here. And he wasn't passing over this opportunity. He said, okay, he died. Now I'm going to make my move. Not to say you profit from someone's death. I'm not, I'm not advocating for this kind of behavior. I'm just talking about the fact that he saw this opportunity and he made his move to attain control of this company. Check this out. Charlie Pemberton, the son of John Pemberton. John Pemberton is a drug addict who started, uh, started Coca-Cola, who created uh, the, the original elixir. His son, Charlie, whom John had given the name Coca-Cola to, so his son Charlie was sitting on a multi-billion dollar asset for future generations, but he didn't know it. 
Charlie was an alcoholic and he too was an opium addict. So Charlie, the son of John, well, he, he was also on that dope. So Charlie, an alcoholic and opium addict, unnerved Asa Candler more than anyone else. Candler is said to have quickly maneuvered to purchase the exclusive rights to the name Coca-Cola from Pemberton's son, Charlie, immediately after he learned of Dr. Pemberton's death. One of several stories states that Candler approached Charlie's mother at John Pemberton's funeral and offered her $300 in cash for the title to the name. Charlie Pemberton, the son of John, Charlie Pemberton, the son of John who invented the Coca-Cola formula, was found dead on June 23rd, 1894, unconscious with a stick of opium by his side. Sorry, he was found unconscious. Ten days later, he died at Atlanta's Grady Hospital at the age of 40. So he died as a drug addict. He died, he was found unconscious with a stick of opium by his side. So he got caught slipping, slipping and sleeping. Like a lot, a lot of our people in our community, how many of our people out here are so just getting high on that dope? The dope might be, it might not be opium, but it might be something else. The dope of white supremacy, the dope of complacency, the dope of Negro naysayerism, the dope of laziness, the dope of a lack of focus, the dope of entertainment, where you're paying more attention to entertainers and you're paying attention to the future of your family. So, so he was on that dope. Asa was alert. Asa was awake. Asa wasn't going to be poor because he didn't pass over opportunities repeatedly. He had what we talk about in the Black Business School as OPP. OPP uh, stands for Opportunity, Patience, and Perspective. Opportunity, Patience, and Perspective. He spotted the opportunity. He patiently waited to make a move. He patiently waited to blow, like Dr. Dre used to say in that song. He patiently waited to blow. Sorry, right. Sorry, I scratched that. It was 50 Cent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 50 Cent Show. I've been patiently waiting to blow, right? So he was patient. He had perspective. He said, man, this Coca-Cola thing, I think this is. I think eventually one day my grandkids are going to own half of Atlanta because this Coca-Cola thing is, is really catching on. I'm going to get my piece in the game and secure a legacy for my family while everybody's slipping and sleeping and getting high on dope. I'm going to be focused and I'm going to have perspective so I can establish ownership in this company that's going to be worth a lot of money one day. John Pemberton's family wasn't thinking that way. His son was just looking to get high. His son was just looking for the, you know, looking for a way to, he was looking for the local dope man. Like Ice Cube used to say, to be a dope man, boy, you must qualify. Don't get high on your own supply. So, so he wasn't the, he was, you know, one of these guys, let's just keep it 100. Let's talk, let's go back to that Jeezy Gucci language. One of these guys was looking to be the dope dealer. The other one was looking to be the dope addict. One was the dealer. One was the addict. One was going to be the pimp. One wanted to be the hoe. So I want you to ask yourself this question. Give me, give me an answer in the chat. If you look at the dynamic, the relationship between the dope dealer and the dope fiend, who has the most power in that relationship, the dealer or the addict? The dealer or the addict? I want you to answer that question. Then I'm going to follow up with another question. When you look at black people in America, are we the ones who are in control or are we the ones who are being controlled? Are we the dealer or are we the addict? Are we are we the are we trying to be are we trying to run this thing? Or are we trying to be somebody's hoe? So Charlie Pemberton, the the son of the founder of Coca-Cola, the son of the man who created the elixir, John Pemberton, the drug addict who was uh, a Confederate soldier who created Coca-Cola, was found dead from an opium overdose. When he died, nothing was secured in terms of his legacy. Asa, who had OPP, Opportunity, Patience, and Perspective, or you might also want to call this Other People's Profits, Other People's Profits, right? That Asa, Asa said, I'm going to secure something for my family. So let me tell you what Asa did. So Charlie Pemberton, uh, he, he unnerved Asa Candler. I'm going to read more here. He unnerved Asa Candler more than anyone else. Candler is said to have quickly maneuvered to purchase the exclusive rights to the name Coca-Cola from Pemberton's son Charlie immediately after he learned of Dr. Pemberton's death. Charlie was found dead or he died at Atlanta Grady's Hospital at the age of 40 after being found unconscious with a stick of opium by his side. In Charles Howard Candler's 1950 book about his father, so the son of, of Asa Candler, named Charles, wrote a book in 1950. He wrote, he said, on August 30th, 1888, Asa Candler became the sole proprietor of Coca-Cola, a fact which, he sta which was stated on letterheads, invoice blanks, and advertising copy. With this action, 
On August 30th, 1888, Candler's sole control became technically all true. Candler had negotiated with Margaret Dozier and her brother, Wolfert Walker, a full payment amounting to $1,000, which all agreed Candler could pay off with a series of notes over a specified time span. By May 1st, 1889, Candler was now claiming full ownership over the Coca-Cola beverage. So Asa Candler, who didn't even create the drink, obtained full control over this company in, a pro in less than five or six years after it was invented. All the control was in the hands of John Pemberton, the drug addict who created Coca-Cola, his son Charlie, who he gave the name Coca-Cola to, which was worth eventually going to be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. But, but John and Charlie got caught in that dope. And they got, got caught slipping and sleeping. And that's what I constantly say to you, especially you as a black man. You see, let me tell you about another example uh, that, that relates to this, what this made me think about. I had an interview one time with some, young, with some uh, individuals who grew up in the South Bronx in the 1970s when this thing was emerging, this powerful new art form that was going to change the world. This powerful new art form called hip hop was emerging. Hip hop started with DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, et cetera, Africa Bambata down in the South Bronx and, and then part other parts of New York. And hip hop was going to change the world. And I said to them, I said, hip hop is now worth trillions of dollars. People have made trillions of dollars off this art form. I said, did y'all realize what you had? Were you were you thinking at all about the impact of, of what was being created and how, uh, how much wealth was being was going to be passed around? And you know what they said? They said, they said, nah, Dr. Boyce, man, we, we was just looking, we was, we was just looking to have fun. We was just looking for the party. So I said, okay, I get it. So, so we were, we spent so much time looking for the party that we weren't looking for the power. We were looking to get high. It's just a different kind of dope. That's all it is. If you always looking for the party, if you always looking for the fun, if you always looking for another joke, if you always looking for some entertainment to watch, then, then, then you're going to be caught, get caught slipping and sleeping. When the real movers and shakers, the people that the real power brokers are positioning themselves for extraordinary amounts of wealth. So this is exactly what happened. This is this is uh, this is basically uh, an example. This is the story of Coca-Cola, this company that was purchased by Asa Candler for twenty three hundred dollars. That's now worth a quarter of a trillion dollars. That's pretty much what's happened all throughout black communities, all throughout the history of this of this of this country. We because we don't spend as much time talking about wealth as we spend talking about football, basketball, and hip hop, we miss out. We miss a lot of things. Poor, P O O R, stands for passing over opportunities repeatedly. Asa Candler wasn't playing. Asa Candler wasn't sitting around looking to get high. He was he was constantly jockeying for position. He was like, oh, okay, well you know, okay, so uh, you having a hard time financially? Let let me take that asset off your hands. Like I'll give you, I'll put three hundred dollars in your pocket right now. So if you are short sighted, see see uh, uh, see uh, Warren Buffett actually describes wealth in America is pretty much a transfer of power from short sighted people. To, to, to people that have the ability to delay gratification. That's all it is. It's a transfer of, 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 of resources from those who are undisciplined to those who are disciplined. That's all it is. It's a short, it, it's literally a transfer. People that have that, that seek instant gratification will always be manipulated by those who have patience and perspective. So if you ever want to know a secret to wealth, the secret to thinking like an investor, the secret to, to, to where rich people come from, just understand one term. It's called delayed gratification. And this is not me just talking. This is proven through scientific theory. They did a study at Stanford University where they took a bunch of five-year-olds and they basically measured the five-year-old's ability to delay gratification. Can you pass up the short-term reward in exchange for the long-term payout? They, they use marshmallows to, to, to make their point. And so they, they, they sorted the kids out based on who could delay gratification and who uh, was trying to get high on their own supply, right? And literally, the kids that were able to delay gratification were far more successful in every aspect of life than the kids who had to have it now. 
Now, I want you to look at our culture. I want you to look at some of the music that comes out in our community that 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 influences the way some of our young people think. And, and I want you to think about songs like I'm Riding Around and I'm Getting It. Remember that song? I think this rapper came out of Atlanta. It might have been Two Chains. Atlanta, the same place where Coca-Cola is now, where they own half of Atlanta now. Right? And the song was I'm Riding Around and I'm Getting It. It's mine. I spend it. It's mine. I spend it. I heard another rapper. Uh, I think this was Yo Gotti, a good, a great rapper, very talented. But I, I heard the song where he said, he said, we're going to ball today. We're going to ball today. F tomorrow. We don't care about tomorrow. We ain't thinking about tomorrow. We're trying to ball today. We're trying to have it all now. We're trying to throw it up in the club. We're trying to make it rain. Right. That, that inability to delay gratification, the inability to think beyond a five or 10 year horizon, the inability to think about your family in the next generation is the number one reason that so much wealth passes right over your head. It will pass right by you because you can't see past next Tuesday. The paycheck mentality, paycheck to paycheck mentality that many of us are raised with, where your goal in life is not to build wealth. Your goal in life is to get a job for a white man who's going to pay you every Friday. That short-term mentality causes us to pass over trillions of dollars in wealth. That $1.4 in income that we get goes right out of our hands because we're not thinking about the long-term potential of what this $1.4 trillion can create. Coca-Cola was purchased for $2,300. In 1889, $2,300 was about $64,000 today. So a, the idea that you can flip 64 grand into 226 billion is absolutely unbelievable for a lot of people because they can't think past next Friday. So what I want you to understand is this. Here's where I want to circle this back around to. And by the way, do me a favor. Before I, I give my conclusion, I want you to uh, feel free uh, to take a look at financialworkbooks.com. We have financial workbooks for children we created in the Black Business School. If you're interested in teaching wealth to your kids, these workbooks are excellent. We also have flashcards. We have all kinds of stuff. We have stuff on Amazon. Just feel free to go look it up. Just look up uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins and financial workbooks and, and you'll find them. They're all over all over the place. And you can go to financialworkbooks.com if you want to take a look. Also, text the word Boyce to 31996 if you want to get text alerts when we go live. Hit the thumbs up button. Please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll be notified when we go live. All right, because we're building black media here and, and we need your help. We need your help to build black media because I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure my grandkids are trillionaires. I just want you to know that my great grandkids are going to be triple trillionaires and I want your great grandkids to be in that position, too. So we're building a media empire right now that's going to make sure that none of them has to borrow money to go to college. None of them ever has to work for a white man. None of them ever has to go beg and grovel and give away their family wealth just so they can get by till next Tuesday. My 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 triple great grandkids are not going to go through that cuz I'm I, I'm I'm trying to be like Asa Candler. All right. So so let let me let me let me jump in here and and give you a conclusion here. So so to summarize what I've been talking to you guys about for the last 37 minutes and 55 seconds. The story started with John Pemberton. If you came in late, you need to go start at the beginning of this video. I need you to listen. I need you to go have your kids listen to. John Pemberton, a drug addict Confederate soldier who was addicted to morphine created Coca-Cola in a lab because he wanted this to be an alternative to the dope he was already addicted to. He stole the name. There was a Spanish company called Cola Coca. He stole the name, but he did a good job of marketing the company <clears throat> and, and it started to catch on. Now, John thought about his son, Charlie. He thought about his legacy. He gave the name Coca-Cola to his son, Charlie. Unfortunately, Charlie, too, became a morphine addict. All the while, Asa Candler was consistently making moves to get bits and pieces of ownership of this company. He was offering a few hundred dollars here, a few hundred dollars there. He took advantage of, of the fact that the Candler family, uh, sorry, not Candler family, sorry, Pemberton family, John Pemberton, uh, that, that, that they had a dope problem. So when John's son, Charlie, died from a morphine overdose, Asa Candler made a move to obtain full rights to the Coca-Cola company. He sacrificed a lot of money. What was a lot of money back then? I'm sure he could have went out and bought him a hundred Gucci belts. He could have went out and bought a whole lot of Popeye's chicken. He could have bought him a new, couple pairs of Air Jordans with that, or whatever they, whatever the equivalent of Air Jordans was in 1889. He could have, he could have got all of that, but he didn't do that. He thought about his family's legacy, so he took his money and he bought full rights to the Coca-Cola company in about 1889 or 1890. As a result of this $2,300 power move, 
he eventually became the full owner of Coca-Cola, which was eventually incorporated. And now Coca-Cola is worth a quarter of a trillion dollars and they own a big chunk of Atlanta. So right now, so what, how does this relate to you? How does this relate to us as black people? Well, it relates to us as black people right now due to the fact that many of you are sitting on tiny little raggedy ass little businesses that, that you don't think are worth a nickel that are going to be worth the billions of dollars for your great grandchildren. Many of you are sitting right there under your nose. You have something right in front of you right now in the year 2020, the year 2021, that in the year 2100 is going to be worth something, an amount of money that you can't even fathom right now because, because we, we don't have the vision to see what it is. Some of you have planted seeds right now that are going to grow into absolute sycamore trees. They're going to grow into something bigger and and badder and bolder, the elephant in the room, something so massive that you can't even imagine or fathom what it's going to become. Some of you are in the early stages of what will become a multi-trillion dollar empire. And and, and what has to occur right now is you got to sort of understand the mistakes that were made in 1886 by John Pemberton and his son, Charlie. What are some of the mistakes? Well, number one, if you're constantly high, there's a reason why I don't use drugs or drink alcohol. I've never used drugs or drank alcohol my whole life. I'm not putting me down if you do any of those things, but I never did those things because I noticed, I looked around, I saw black men, even some of whom in my own family, who spent so much time being high that they weren't alert to their environment, so they were missing opportunities. They were being exploited. Drugs and alcohol, like Malcolm X said, the white man will sell you the liquor bottle and then he'll lock you up for being drunk. When you out here, when you out here on that dope, it makes you very vulnerable. Well, Charlie Pemberton, the son of John, who owned the Coca-Cola company, was too busy looking for morphine, morphine to even know the value of what he had. So he got taken advantage of Asa Candler, who was always fully alert and fully prepared to make an investment that would allow him to control a company that would eventually be worth a quarter of a trillion dollars. So what I'm saying to you is that people who tend to build wealth for their families, people who win this economic game are the people who don't spend their time slipping and sleeping. They don't spend their time locked up in the fog of of buffoonery, uh, sitting around watching, watching TV all day, of paying more attention to their favorite entertainer than they're paying attention to their own family's wealth and, and circumstances. They don't, they don't sit around had just hanging out on social media, you know, following big booty girls on Instagram or, 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 or gossiping about what some celebrity did with their life and not spending any time building their own. They don't get caught up in the dope. Social media is, 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 is a, another form of morphine. Actually that social media addiction is very real. A lot of our people have, are addicted to that. A lot of people are addicted to social media. So we, we spend time taking in social media the same way a drug addict takes in their drugs. And all the while, Mark Zuckerberg is out there making $10 million a day. He, he, he probably, did you know, did you guys know this? Pay attention now, listen to this. Most social media experts do not allow their children to spend much time on social media. Did y'all know this? There's a whole Netflix documentary. Uh, what was that, babe? The, the Netflix documentary? that we watched about social media addiction. Do you remember what it was called? Okay, Alicia, she's an expert on the subconscious mind. She's a, a full professor of social work and, and an expert in psychology. So, I, so I'll find the name of this documentary, but they talk about how social media addiction is causing people to pretty much waste their lives, right? So most social media experts, if you ask them, well, how much time do you let your kids spend on social media? They say, oh, no, I restrict the, the amount of time my kids spend on social media. Well, you know what that does? All that reminds me of is when Ice Cube made that song, Dope Man. And he said, to be a dope man, boy, you must must qualify. Don't get high off your own supply. So basically, the dope man will sling, will sling dope to you all day long, but he doesn't get high on his own supply because he's trying to stay alert so he can go get that money. If somebody's running a nightclub, he's going to come out. He's going to pretend to mingle with you for a minute. He's going to sit with you and, and, and have a little glass of champagne that he's not even, well, he's not even going to barely sip it. And then, but, then, but he wants you to drink up. He's going to want you to buy extra bottles at the table. And then he's going to go to the back and he's going to be out in the back counting his money. He's not going to be getting drunk at all, but he wants you to be as, as, as drunk as possible. So what I, I want you guys to understand is that 
In this world, there are sharks and there are fish. In this world, there are wolves and there are sheep. And now I'm not telling you to go be a wolf. A wolf has a negative connotation because that means that you're out exploiting people. I'm not telling you to go exploit people. But 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 you definitely don't want to be a sheep. In fact, actually, I don't want you to go out and become a wolf. Uh, I would prefer, if you want my preference, uh, maybe you could just be a sheep with a gun. Uh, be the head, be the head sheep, and carry a gun so that when you see the wolves, you can blow the brains out. You can make sure that the wolves can't can't take what you got. So, so at the end of the day, I need you to understand that this whole wealth game is played in a way that is very strategic. It is built on your ability to see things other people cannot see. You have to know where opportunities lie, and you have to commit yourself to all of this. Because if you do not, then some of your little raggedy businesses, that these little tiny businesses you got that didn't make 20 cents last year, are going to grow into multi-billion dollar companies, and your children are going to miss out on that because you don't see the opportunity that lies in front of you. One big example might be Antoine Walker. I went to college with a basketball player by the name of Antoine Walker. Antoine Walker was a star on the basketball team at the University of Kentucky when I was a graduate student there. We were having black student protests at that time. We could not get Antoine to help us with the protests, and a lot of people believed Antoine could not read because Antoine was so caught up in playing basketball that apparently nobody told him that when you get all that money in the NBA, if you're not careful, they're going, these, these, these people are going to try to take everything you got. Well, Antoine... Uh, again, because he's caught up in that dope, the dope of sports. That's another type of dope they slain to every black neighborhood across America. He was caught up in the dope of sports. He thought that as long as I could dribble a basketball, I ain't got to worry about reading. I ain't got to worry about becoming financially literate. I ain't got to worry about being alert when it comes to my money because I'm good. I can chase the booty and the bling and, and get the fancy clothes and the fancy cars and have all the women and everything else, right? That's what they, that's what they teach black men. That's what they put into our head. Well, guess what? Antoine Walker played many years in the NBA. He was an extraordinary player. He made over $110 million, and he left that league with nothing. He left that league completely broke. And the people that got rich off of Antoine were his, uh, I'm sure his, his, I'm sure that his manager uh, didn't walk away from that situation broke. I'm sure his accountant isn't broke. I'm sure his lawyers ain't broke. I'm sure whatever little white and Jewish people that were standing around him who went to Harvard, who didn't know how to dribble basketball, but they went to Harvard business school. I'm sure that their families aren't broke. I'm sure their families are going to have millions of dollars, billions of dollars in the future. So, so the, the, the thing that you have to understand is that when Antoine let go of all that money, when he let go of that $110 million, he didn't give away $110 million. He gave away about $10 billion. Because if you invest $110 million consistently and intelligently, you can turn that into 10, into billions of dollars within a generation. So he didn't just lose his money. He lost his children's money. He lost his grandchildren's money. He lost his great-grandchildren's money. He lost his great-great-grandchildren's money. He lost his great-great-great-grandchildren's money. So there are children who will struggle financially in the year 2150 because their great-great-great-grandfather, Antoine, had $110 million and he blew the bag. And the problem for many of our people is that y'all think that shit's funny. Y'all think that's entertainment. Y'all think that's that's hilarious. There's a whole BET show. I'm not playing, I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. There's a whole BET series called Blue the Bag where all they do is they laugh. They show some laughing Negro saying, hi, oh, yeah, man, I had, I, won, I had won the lottery. And when I won the lottery, I went to the club and I got, I had some, I got some women and I got some bottles and we party. And I spent all that money in a weekend. <laughs> so I, and I got seven kids with six babies, mamas. And I didn't, I didn't, they ain't getting nothing, but, but shoot, we had, we had fun and night. We had had fun, right? Like they think that's funny. BET, y'all know BET, right? BET is that white owned company that pretends to be black where white people are distributing, uh, uh, self, self, self-destructive imagery uh, to black people on a regular basis to keep you so hooked on that dope, so distracted that you're not seeing the real wealth being built around you. Oh, that company is run by the family of Sumner Redstone. Sumner Redstone's family is not broke. Sumner Redstone's family, they're, 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 not, they're, they're not waiting on a welfare check. They're, they don't need a stimulus package. They're, they don't need WIC to feed their children. They, Sumner Redstone's family probably makes about $10 million a day. I just want you to know that, right? But but they own BET, so I just just so you know, just so you know all the facts. While y'all over here laughing, 
about people that blew a bag, that blew their generational wealth. They, they don't consider that to be a laughing matter. They make sure that their children, when their children are five, their children meet the financial planner so they can talk about strategic ways to protect the family wealth. I just want you to understand the difference in mentality between somebody who's going to laugh about how they blew the bag on strippers and weed and liquor versus somebody who makes sure that their five-year-old understands the pillars of wealth, uh, which is investing in the stock market, in real estate, and also starting a business. When they're teaching their children, uh, they're, they're teaching their children the children the family corporate bylaws uh, when they're in the second grade. I, I just need you to kind of know the difference. When, they're, when their children are learning uh, where the family assets are kept in the Swiss bank accounts, your kids are going to fucking football camp. I just kind of need you to know the difference in culture. I need you to think about that a minute so that you'll understand when people ask you, where did the black wealth go? You'll be able to answer that question or you can at least refer them to this video so that maybe we can train up a child a little bit and train them up a little bit and help them understand that this game is being played at a level where the wealth builders are vibrating on level five and you're vibrating on level one where all you're doing is paying attention to strippers and weed and hookers and and bottles and they're paying attention to, to 401ks and trust accounts and, and, and Swiss bank accounts and, and LLCs and entities and, and real estate holdings that they have all throughout the world. I just kind of need you to understand the difference in the mindset so you'll understand why you might be broke. Understand this, Black people. It don't take no money at all for you to elevate your thinking. It costs you no money to listen to this conversation. All you had to pay was attention. You didn't have to pay any money, but you had to pay attention. Some of our people can't even do that. But let me tell you a little thing about wealth, and then I'm going to finish up and go get out of here. Those who are not paying attention are the ones who get exploited. Black people are known, if you look at the Nielsen studies, where they study black people like rats in a lab so they can figure out how to get black people's money. These are real reports. Nielsen is a multi-billion dollar company that makes its billions studying how people buy products so they can sell that information to corporations. They have full reports on black people. Sometimes they know more about you than you know about yourself. When they write these reports, one of the things that they say about black people is this. They say black people are always slipping and sleeping. Black people stay in a constant trance. They're in a hypnotic state. Black people watch more media than any group of people in America. They watch more television than anyone else. This is what, this is what they write in their reports for other white people to read. Black people use social media more than anybody else. Oh, black people, oh, they'll spend money. They love to spend more than anybody else because their number one goal is to look cool. They, they really, they enjoy being trendy more than anybody else. And then they take these reports and they use these reports to basically catch you the same way Asa Candler caught Charlie Pemberton slipping and sleeping, passed out next to a morphine stick and said, let me go in and take this fool for his paper because he ain't paying attention. He's sitting on top of the Coca-Cola Corporation, ownership of the name of a company that I believe is gonna be worth an extraordinary amount of money. And he don't even know it because all he's looking for is a chance to get high. So be alert, black people. That is how you can get ahead. Everybody ain't going to get this message, but this is, I'm preaching to the choir right now. I really don't care about the people in the back. I don't care much about the people who don't want to come to church today. I'm talking to the people in the front that want to understand how this game works. And I'm not somebody just talking on the internet. I am a financial scientist. I have studied wealth for the last 30 years. And I can tell you with complete certainty that a big chunk of wealth building comes down to the basics of economic awareness, financial consciousness, being economically woke. And a lot of our people are asleep and that's why they get exploited. Well, I'm going to go guys. Um, I put the URL blackfinancialsecurity.com. If you want to learn the secrets to black financial security, feel free to go to blackfinancialsecurity.com. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a training I have right there. That's totally free. You can watch it right now. If you want to, you can watch it with your family. You're going to love it. And I break down 
key elements to financial security that you can apply to your family that will make sure that your family has a legacy of wealth going forward for the next five generations. Uh, we, we're thinking big on this. We're thinking about the next 120, 130 years. Uh, we are talking about 100 year family wealth plans. We're doing things that are, are bigger than the booty and the bling. We're not just trying to teach you how to get a Mercedes and, and, and a fancy house. We're talking about how you can achieve economic freedom for your family for the next 100, 200 years. The, this is how legacies are established. This is how it's done. So do me a favor, please hit the thumbs up button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, also, please hit the notification bell so you'll be notified when we go live. Um, also, if you uh, want to join us for tonight's film, we're going to watch the film Happy, which is all about the roots of economic systems going all the way back to ancient Africa, directed by Taki Grant. I'm an executive producer. Uh, you can get your pass at blackmovienight.net. That's blackmovienight.net. Uh, so I'm going to get out of here, guys. I hope you guys uh, appreciated the presentation. I didn't plan for it to be a presentation. I thought it was going to be a 15 minute discussion. I, I swear to God, I literally started off thinking this was going to be 15 minutes, but sometimes the Holy Spirit catches me. And when God tells me to preach, I got to keep on going. I don't even go to church, but I reference God all the time because I know without, without God in the universe and, and, uh, and spirituality, I cannot do the things that I do uh, because you have to be spiritual to see the greatness in our people in the middle of all this chaos. So I encourage you to just realize that black people will rise again. The black man will rise again. The black family will rise again. The black community will rise again. The question is, how long is it going to take? And I encourage you, those who are listening, who are part of what I consider to be the talented 10th, to train your children to be the economic soldiers who will make our community great again. We will achieve that goal. I have no doubt. It's just going to happen after we're gone. But we got to plant the seeds so that we can win and we can make sure that we achieve everything that we're supposed to achieve and have everything we're supposed to have. Do it for the babies. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for your babies. I'll talk to you later. Love you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you later. Peace.